All right, so my first stop on this uh, 2d6 dungeon journey is going to be with the completion of the first room that I did, but as a little intro, I'll say that I back this. I don't back Kickstarters. This is the first and only Kickstarter that I have backed. That was a brand new game, and I got the, the Lairs expansion, the two physical books, and the cards, and I put the cards in this little box because... Unfortunately, they were they have this black border and I just really don't like black borders on cards because it's like so prime for chipping. I think the cards themselves probably don't need to be sleeved if they were designed differently and they had a white border like Quest for the Lost Pixel cards or something like that. I wouldn't have had to sleeve them, but once I sleeve them, they didn't fit in the box and so I just kind of repurposed the box itself to make my own little box here and that are those are the cards. So, what did I do? Well, I made my character and uh, this again was a little bit of a um, little bit of a disappointment in the sense that there's just there's not much to the characters at all. There's no races or classes and it's just a couple of stats that you fill in that are the some dice manipulation stats here for the shift and the discipline and I just I wasn't feeling much about it. I mean my whole my whole character is based around this heavy mace, and per the game rules, you 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 stick with this one weapon throughout the whole game. So I got my couple of maneuvers with it, and um, that was really that was really my character. I got the reflex scroll, which has to do with oh, I didn't put that down. That's like a combat spell, and I that was kind of it. I was just feeling a little bit like, well, oh, well, this is something I picked up. We'll talk about that in a second. So anyway, I, I made my character and um, such as it was and got my initial small items. Then I started out and the very first room that, uh, so here's my entrance room. And then the very first room that I rolled up was this big room here. And it ended up being a, basically an empty storeroom. And I ended up in it, the, my instructions were to sort of go down cr to create storage and roll on these various tables. And I ended up getting just a ton of stuff. I got the, I got an extra healing potion. I got some, well, let's see, I sort of wrote them down here, but I can't even really read that. There was an open chest. It had some metal spikes and a rope and a lock pick. And then I uh, got, um, I got something else that I have in my inventory. And then on the way out, I love the way this was done. So we've got the, the contents here of this room. And then on the way out, this level two trap, this was a some sort of swinging ball trap thing. Whoop. It hit me on the way out. I couldn't quite get out of the way. And I got two damage out of there. So you can see my health is down to eight. But it was totally worth it because I picked up, I got a whole other healing potion. And then I got this, uh, these six metal spikes, a rope, and this lockpick. So as it unfolded, as I was rolling on the tables, I was, I was feeling like, okay, I could, could bring a little more story to this because up until that point, it just, it felt kind of blank, honestly. So I took the opportunity to, at that point, I didn't even really have a name for my character. Oh, I still, still haven't written my character's name down, but I was just kind of inspired and I went to the fourth page of my character sheet here and I wrote wrote a letter in in room one and I decided I was writing to Lord Bane and I was a um, I was a knight Sir Wrath and I said Lord Bane the gods shine upon me as I enter this dungeon an abandoned crate room from the vain glorious king sits oh abandoned <laughs> not the greatest writing and I procure useful items for my travels but wait, as I leave, a boulder trap hits me, but I sustain only minor wounds, and the extra healing potion I now have made the journey worth it. Yours in struggle, Sir Wrath. So once I did that, I felt a little bit better, and then I was inspired to grab this little mini that I have that actually looks kind of like a cleric, and this little picture I've got, which is going to be my my knight, uh, Sir Wrath, and, um, and just kind of place them here. And I think that sort of doing that is helping me feel a little bit more like I'm 
going to be developing a story and feel a little bit more attached to this. We're going to be traveling down this way next, and uh, we'll see. We'll see. This is a it, – it's um, – Having the crate storage here also, I said, made me feel like this was in some type of an actual dungeon in a castle, that this is storage for the castle. So we'll see. I don't know what's going to happen when I roll up the next room. Is that Am I going to be able to relate that in what way? So that's really the question in my mind at this stage. I'm, I'm sort of cautiously optimistic. As I said, not um, initially, I was a little bit put off because I did not, well, first of all, I didn't realize when I printed my character sheet this way, it would be so big. That was kind of annoying. I probably had a digital file that could have been layout, but I just didn't realize that this was, I thought this would be single the size of the book. And obviously it's not. So that, uh, that was just a little off-putting to, you know how it is, you can kind of focus on things that may not mean much. But in any event, that's uh, this is where we stand, room one, and uh, you know I'm, I'm interested enough to continue playing, and we'll check back in when I've gotten further, further along. All right, this seems like a good entry number two in my 2D6 dungeon vlog. We are... We, well, we have just defeated this apothecary here that gave us 35 experience points, which almost doubled the amount that we had prior to the encounter. So that was awesome. We're at about 70-something. We'll take a look at that in a minute. We're in an apothecary here. There's uh, described there were jars and bottles on the table, and we rolled for the tables that were indicated and luckily we got some serious healing potions because we basically had when we last checked in we had two healing potions we used them all up and we were down to just basically our 10 health and i'm telling you that is not enough to get through at least this first level had i not found the potion the additional potion of healing in this crate storage on the first turn of the game, I would have not made it this far in the first level. I would have died here by the dark cleric in room three. There just, there's not enough health, at least for my experience in playing through. But I did find that and I did use it to survive the encounter with the apothecary where I now have, I'm feeling comfortable with this other potion of healing for plus 10 and this further healing, which will give 25, and it even says I can exceed my baseline. Now, once I level up, which hopefully I'll be able to do, my baseline health will go immediately from 10 to 20, so that's good. But right now we are sitting at the um, 10 health, and we just restored that, and then we took out the apothecary. So what has happened? Well, we the second room we found this uh these some unidentified carcasses in this room. We fought the butcher and we I took some meat from here. This gave me the bloodied condition. So I haven't been able to clean up. So every room I go to, I'm continuing on. And if I can't get to a place to clean up, I'm going to be losing an HP per room until I wash up. So I may need to... Um, down one of these potions to stay alive. I hope that doesn't happen, but it was worth it because we traveled back and then we encountered a, 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 a chapel and there was a shrine here and the shrine was to the god of rot. So we were able to make a bone offering because I had, um, I had, cut off some pieces of meat and they were meat on the bone. And so I did offer up that to the God and therefore we got our one, our first favor point. And so that was, that was just kind of luck that it turned out that I had gotten something and it was for the right God. We traveled on, there was a tapestry room here um, to another God, but specifies no room for offerings here. We continued along. We found a morgue and there was a body in the morgue. We, we had to fight the artisan that was in here. That was actually pretty easy. I left the body alone because 
the rules specify that cannibalism and um, you know trying to use bodies for food or rations is uh, there's a downside to that so I just left that body alone and then we came into the apothecary and we're sort of here now I'm still here there's scrolls on the wall I don't really know um, invented Inventage, u inventive usage rules here. I was looking back over those again, and it says, you know, you can do sort of what makes sense narratively. And we'll just take a quick look. While you explore the dungeon, you will read text that describes rooms and encounters. You can interact with these rooms. Inventive usage, an imaginative form of role play that allows you freedom to improvise. Guidelines, imagination mixed with common sense. Enemy corpses, uh, you can't take their armor or weapons. Well, we're not, in, that's not the deal here. I did, um, that is how I became bloodied when I took down those, those corp, the, the animal um, meats that were hanging there. That's how I became bloodied. Uh, making sounds. So if we're doing something that would cause a sound, we do an alarm check. That makes sense. Containers, it's describing half an ornate item. Um, offerings to the gods, fires, herbal remedies. So the thing is here, can I, there's scrolls on the wall. Can I take, how many of them are there? Can I just like make up that I roll a d6 and you know, there's three scrolls on the wall and I'm going to take them and then they're going to turn into um, these magic scrolls that I now have. This, I'm not, that seems maybe a little too easy, but I don't know. I don't know. The the instructions in the game tell you that as you begin a level, you should read the information about the level because it will help you interact with the level. And we read here that um, level one and, and level two domains are where the lower level humans live and work. It's an area where loot captives and resources are kept, expect to find, etc. So we're there to take what we can. And uh, it specifically said there's scrolls on the wall. So I'm a little, you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do there. So that's, that's where we are. The, how do I feel so far? The combat. So the combat um, with the, uh, the modifiers and the shift, I mean, this is the basic mechanic of the game that you are attempting to roll some numbers for your dice set and you can manipulate the uh, the dice to get those numbers based on the the shift number that you have and in order to ensure that combat kind of ramps up in excitement and draws to a conclusion as you go through the combat you are ticking up this combat fatigue die and once you get to four you start to add in shifts. So both you and your adversary get shifts. Now, I found that basically this puts a lot of focus on that first round of combat where you have your additional shift. If you can really get going there and ensure that you are doing something that will give you the most damage, you have a shot. But of course, your damage itself is going to be random. It's going to be dependent on your roll. Now, that's great if I rolled seven damage, but I was rolling a lot of ones when I got to my big damage. So in some cases where I had an adversary with 12 health, I was like slowly taking it down. The other thing that happens is the interrupt. So if in the case of this apothecary, I am rolling something that is a, an attack with a primary die of one or four, all of a sudden, whatever I'm doing is going to be minus two damage because it's been interrupted. And as the case was, one of my attacks did have a primary die of four. So whenever I did that, instead of getting just the d6 damage, it was reducing it down to a d6 minus two. Now that of course is it does add variety to the combat and you know you need to uh, you need to be in order for it not to just be die rolling and, and, and moving things around, you need to focus on its blinding smoke that he's doing a firebomb or a gas cloud is um, happening and that did actually happen a couple times where I was just unable to attack. And so I think 
as with most solo play, when it gets down to combat, the more you think about it and imagine it, at least for me, the better it is. And here, while there is this, um, it's a, I like the mechanic and it gives you something to think about and do. It's still very luck based. Obviously it's all based on a die roll. You don't really control so much as it seems because this, this shift number of two or the additional shift modifier, the, the basis for it is still just a random die roll. So you're not, not really making as many selections as it might seem, I think. At least as I was playing it, it did feel that way. Is that a problem? Not yet. It's not yet a problem. I do worry a little bit that playing through, I mean, I'm not even, unless I die, I'm not even halfway through the space of this dungeon, and this is just level one, it could get a little repetitive uh, because there's not a lot, there are not a lot of options. And in a game like Four Against Darkness, and at the end of this, at the end of this uh, video, I am going to talk a little bit about the comparisons between Four Against Darkness and D100 Dungeon, because I think people are interested in knowing about that. I will say that one of the things that Four Against Darkness has to offer is, even though the rules and the rolling in that game may be superficially more simpler, because you have so many different characters that you're running with different types of options and choices. And uh, you can, if you are a gnome, you can create, a, you know, you can tinker something or you can do a spell or you can try to control a troll, something like that. It feels like you have more choices here than in this game where you know what you're going to do. You're just going to be attempting to get these numbers. That said, I'm still, um, still going with it and still perfectly... I'm happy that I survived. I was bummed out. I thought I died in this apothecary, but then I realized I had a one more of those healing uh, potions. So that saved me. And um, it's it's pretty brutal, though. As I said, I would have only made it to room three if I hadn't lucked out and gotten that second healing potion in room number one. So a few points here to illustrate what I was just saying. I got to... Then we got into a kennel here, which is pretty awesome because there are water bowls that are going to let me wash off my bloodied condition once I dispense with this guard. Now, I the guard set off this warhound. I did dispense with the warhound, but during the combat, my rolling was so bad that I couldn't even do anything until the fifth round. So I took so much damage, I had to use another healing potion and there was really just nothing I could do. So it was all just down to the rolls that I did were just so poor. Even when I eventually got the um, shift adjustment die for the first time, I couldn't do anything with it until the fifth round. And, you know, that's just the way it goes, but it is, it really is heavily luck based in that regard. I dispensed with the Warhound eventually, as I said, and I got the, um, the treasure of a spiked collar, and now I'm going to deal with this guard. If I survive the guard, who's got a seven health. Oh, and the warhound gave me 25 experience, which is it's it's a lot, and it's um, I don't know. It it seems like a lot more than it should be, um, but I got 25 experience with that, bringing me to not quite leveling up. So I'm at. 98 experience. Um, it would be great to level up before dealing with the guard, but I can't. And so I'm entering that fight with a health just back to six. I do have that one remaining further health potion in my pocket. I just don't want to use it right now. But in any case, the point being just a little frustrating on the, the luck. Although again, the luck here of getting some water bowls that I could clear up the bleeding condition, you know, that's the way it goes. So that's the good luck. So now we're going to face off with the guard. This seems like as good a place as any to get back to little entry here. As you can see, I've made a lot of progress in the dungeon. And 
a few things happened. I picked up a side quest. There was a, a woman that ran in at one point and said her father was missing. And I said, uh, you know, don't worry, I'm going to find him. And my goal was to, if I found a place with a prisoner, to a male prisoner, to release that prisoner, and that that would be her father. And so I got to this holding cell and there was a prisoner and I got really excited. Unfortunately, when I rolled on who it was, it was a dead prisoner, and therefore I don't think uh, that meets the requirements for that quest. Now, I will, I didn't, I don't think I noted down the exact entry. I will say that um, I've been inconsistent in like noting down the, the, the roles that I've made and stuff in the pages because I recommend being better than I have been because you may find yourself wanting to go back and refer to something and just look it up. I could find that prisoner quest again. I did kind of note down um, what it was, but um, oh, I did page 37. Ha! Huh. All right, I'll have to check that myself. But actually, and then I realized there's a different place to actually put the side quest. In any case, you're going to need some uh, bookmarks. I remember there was some. Um, the, I didn't get the bookmark, I guess. I don't know. I guess I didn't order the bookmark in my Kickstarter, which is kind of a bummer because when I saw it, I realized that it actually has information on it. Some of the basic room tables, which would have been nice. I thought it was just decorative. And um, you also do need bookmarks, I think, when you're playing the game. So I use some of the cards, of course, but the bookmark would have been nice to have thematically. Anyway, digressing here. So then the prisoner was dead and I was super bummed and but I was so excited so I got excited and then I got bummed before that um, we had some thing here where I encountered this there was a rough lock and I have lock picks so I got excited about that and I was even able to it, uh, use the lock pick to get into the box I wasted I had lock picks I could use four times I wasted one of them but then I got in but then all I found in there was like basically nothing. It was kind of a disappointment. It was um, some, I think it was these, some dried pumpkin seeds and um, maybe there was this silver cross that restored some health, but it was a one-time use thing only. So the, um, the excitement and then the deflation, that kind of emotionality, it happened in the game. I will say that it really happened mostly from the tables, not the die roll per se, but like rolling the dice and then looking up to see what I got. The combat, I encountered a couple of uh, two, a warrior and a cultist that I needed to deal with in this meeting room at the same time. And that combat went super fast. But again, it felt like it wasn't because I had gotten better per se, it was just because my die rolling was better. So I definitely have improved the speed at which I can roll the dice and you know remember what I need and apply the shifts and all that. But the reason that the warring cultists went down so fast was simply because, not because I had more experience, but just because the, the numbers that came up were good. So that randomness so far, I'm not finding that the experience I getting, I'm getting, I'm now level two, that that experience per se is doing anything for me. I am getting a lot of stuff. I have a bunch of magic scrolls. I have a bunch of potions and I am about to, I think I'm about to possibly pick up another potion, but I'm running out of space for that. The the story such as it is, you know, you can piece this together. And what I did was I had a bunch of empty rooms and kind of storage and like a weapon drop area with that didn't have much stuff. And this damp space that had this musty bloated bloater that was a little fun um, enemy to encounter. But then I came across this meeting room, so I sort of told the story that my, let's see, how did I make my notes here? I said that um, yeah, we had a whole bunch of um, worthless items, and um, there's a ruin shrine, even the weapon dump doesn't offer much. I got a lot of pumpkin seeds. The warrior and the cultist are in a meeting, and my shorthand for that is like they are trying to figure out like what's going on with this the gods here and why is this why is this dungeon sort of fallen into disrepair and ruin? So the story is pretty eh, it's pretty light, but I am 
compelled to continue. I am compelled to move on because the fact is that when you have a book with this much content, one of the tables that's so interesting is called interruptions and unexpected tables. And they are, I will just show you them without doing too much spoilers because I'm, I'm mindful of people wanting to keep this material fresh. So I'll kind of pull back a bit here. This is a table where just a bunch of stuff can happen. You can find things, you can um, encounter NPCs, or you can have a description of a room with something to find. There are even some optional tables and we're gonna roll on this dead prisoner table here that um, this is just going to be the one role I'm going to do in the actual video, the dead prisoner quest table. When you find a dead prisoner, as I did, which I wasn't expecting, we're going to roll on this and see what happens. And it says, this can be applied when you come across a dead prisoner, either through rolling on a table or in the description of the room. There is a note on the body. Encounter anything in the room space first and then roll 2d6 for this table. So we are going to give this a roll and... Um, We'll see here, we roll the seven, and it says, on the note is a rune drawn on a hooded figure. Add robed rune quest. If you face a robed figure in combat, you crush the paper, drawing on the rune's power and do an extra 10 damage on the first successful hit. It's then completed. So we will write that down, we'll note that down, and um, we will get that as a little benefit from from this dead prisoner. As I said, I, hoped, um, I hope to release the uh, the woman's father to her, but that was not meant to be. So I think I'm probably getting close to the end here. There, I had ended up with some spaces here I could potentially explore, and um, I chose to go up instead of down. So there's like this area here, but I think I'm, um, you know, essentially I'm going to be filling in the rest of this space here, and then adding in my staircase and leaving this level. So this is probably going to be my last entry until that happens. And um, I'm going to make my note about that quest. I will say that the it is a very compelling game. It is almost akin in a way to a choose your own adventure kind of game where the way the narrative happens is not by going paragraph to paragraph, but it is by going table entry to table entry as you draw and make your dungeon. Because there's a, it, it does feel, I'm gonna say it feels pre-programmed. That's not bad though in this case, because the content, there's such a great amount of content and built into that is this um, narrative inventiveness that you can do. It doesn't feel pre-programmed in the way choose your own adventures feel pre-programmed to me, which is um, not terribly fulfilling with some exceptions. And in fact, I plan a video pretty soon about some new and, and reimagined pre-programmed uh, choose your own adventure type of RPGs that I think are very successful. But in the kind of older books, it, it, they feel paradoxically rather linear. But here, it, it feels like you are discovering what is already here, but the way you're putting it together is variable. I guess that's the uh, that's the nature of the the the, the pre-programming. So it doesn't feel as open-ended as something like Four Against Darkness. At least the way I play Four Against Darkness, because I have so many supplements and I'm putting them together, making stories for my characters that are going from dungeons to the outside and all sorts of things like that. That can become randomized and um, will unfold with the tables. Here, the tables unfold the story, but the material is already here. There is a lot of content, however, because you've got the 10 levels, you've got all these enemies that you'll be encountering, and a lot is made with um, very concise information, especially if you read the flavor text on the card there to imagine what they're doing, the description of the actual attack they have. So this cultist is just going to start punching you, which kind of makes sense with what he, what his description is. 
And the, uh, it didn't happen with the cultists, but it happened with some other enemies. I got some mishaps on my uh, enemies attacking me, and that was just super exciting. You know, it was really great to see the double ones and then read what happened and like feel so good about myself. So again, an example of like the die rolling itself, it's not so much the excitement of rolling the die, it's more to see what that die roll gives you. And um, that's not a bad thing, it's just, it is just different for this game. So I'm going to plan to uh, finish out the level and then come back and uh, discuss what I did at the end of the level. All right, we did it. I did it. We got to the end of the level here. And at the last, um, as I was running out of room, I rolled up a dead end. So, well, before that, let me go back. Before that, we we recall that I um, got this this special quest thing that was going to allow me to add a plus ten damage to the first successful combat I had against a hooded figure. And who should I encounter in the very next room in the sleeping quarters? But a dark cleric. So with one roll, basically, I think the dark cleric had twelve HP, and then I got my successful roll initially and I added that and took him out. So I completed the the side quest that also gave me a plus 50 experience points. So it would be nice to add that reminder to the sheet. And then on uh, yes and I uh, took out that cleric. So that was awesome. So I'm ending the I'm ending the um, first level with 240 XP toward the third level. I need 500 to get there. I don't know how this measures up or not. I have no idea. I didn't end up losing any HP along. Well, I may have lost HP after I got to the base, but then I regained it somehow. And um, I got just a ton of stuff. And I, most importantly, I have some gold coins and silver coins that I can spend going back to the marketplace. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But just to show the end here, we got a, um, there was a holding cell and I got excited because I was thinking that the prisoner in here might be the prisoner that would enable me to solve that other side quest I have. But when I rolled on the prisoner table, it was a crazed kind of lunatic uh, jailer and no, the jailer was already here. It was a crazed lunatic prisoner and um I had to dispense with him, so I was unable to have him be rescued and become the uh, young lady's father. So that side quest was not um, not destined to be filled. I don't know if I can carry over the side quests to different levels. I'll have to check the rules on that. I didn't feel it made thematic sense to have a staircase down in the jail, so I rolled. I took a chance of having enough room, and I rolled actually what ended up being a dead end. And I put the stairs down there and it was a dump, but then it also became a place for a, another shrine to this god, uh, Nevazator. And I'm not sure, I don't know whether we looked at the uh, gods yet in this video, but we, in our case at any rate, and maybe throughout the game, I don't know, they came up randomly. And in this particular case, uh, Nevazator the Blind, his favorite items, sticks, cloth, hemp, rope, etc. So in this case of a Nevazator the Blind, his favorite items, I have a rope. I, I started out with a rope, actually. So I was able to make an offering to him of that favorite item and gain a favorite point which I marked on my character sheet and I'm going to save for later use. So that was a really nice way to end the level. And as I said, it is a dead end. I followed the rules for making a sort of entry exit shoot here because I am going to leave the dungeon and go try to spend my money, which you can do at a marketplace. And we'll just take a quick look at the instructions there. So there's a whole bunch of instructions about how to determine the the value of what you get at the market and how successful you are at buying and selling. I am probably going to skip over that and simply just take the money that I have and spend it and not go through the, there's a little formula here for market bartering and, um, 
if you what happens when you try to sell I don't really think I have anything that I'm gonna sell so I'm just gonna spend my money and there are some tables that you can select to make purchases and they're at the front here of the codex and you can see things are priced accordingly now I have to confirm whether you can purchase magic items I'm not sure there are there is a price there of course I don't have anything near that but um, I would be able for example to get I think I have enough for example to get some explosive marbles small glass balls that explode when rolled into a room doing 2d6 plus 3 damage with one charge they're worth 50 or they cost 15 gold and I think I have 16 gold so let's see yeah I do well actually only have 13 gold so I couldn't get those as with as with any good dungeon crawler you get stuff to do at the end in the market and attempt to prepare yourself for the next level I do have I ended with a bunch of potions and I filled in here the values of these some of them are really good like this potion of constancy I can't remember where I picked that up but plus one precision and plus one discipline for the whole level so that's really good and I was able to get through the first level without having to use this po this other healing potion which is going to give me 25 health I've been wanting to save that so I'm super glad I have that and then I picked up this potion of resist magic which is going to let me ignore a successful enemy maneuver um, against me that was magic based and then I have this potion of speed I didn't actually see something named potion of speed maybe I missed it there was some other speedy something or other that gives me a plus two attack at the start of combat I put a question mark there because I need to confirm that that's the right uh, meaning of that potion. So I ended with that, and as I said, I got some two gods with beginning favor points there, and um, just a whole bunch of random stuff, including, we didn't mention the herbs. I love the concept of herbs, and I love the herb cards. Let's see, these Dancoma stems, and it tells you what you can possibly use them for, what they're worth if you want to buy them or sell them and how to make you know what you need them for and I like the fact that it's telling me you know it's one of two ingredients for these particular things now as it turns out I have two two types of herbs but they don't make anything together pretty early on in the dungeon I got these Elios petals a delicate yellow petal that crumbles to fine dust to a fine dust with healing properties but as you can see um, when you put them together unfortunately they are each a part of totally different ingredients so that's not going to help me but I'm going to carry them and retain them and um, I love things like this this adds just a nice a nice touch to the game in the sense of when you have things that are precious and when you have things that are not plentiful but can do other things it makes it, it just gives value to the game it makes you feel like you have achieved something and I think that that is the message here ultimately I felt that I got pretty far through getting one level up and when I saw I needed 500 XP to get to the second level or the third level I was a little discouraged but then I saw how quickly I was accumulating those experience points and you can get experience points in the game through things that are not just killing enemies through happenstance through finding things whatever and I like that because you want to feel like you are progressing and you want to feel like you're progressing well, at least I do without spending hours and hours and hours playing the game which is one of the critiques that I have always had about D100 Dungeon. For as much as I love that game, the progress there is very, very slow. To me, it feels that way. But here, I feel like I'm, I'm almost halfway to the next level as I enter the second level of the dungeon, and that feels pretty good. In terms of just a brief comparison to Four Against Darkness and to D100 Dungeon, I think if you're somebody that is very granular and you want to be focusing on different types of armor and the types of damage that they can do and where they can wound an enemy and the impact of that wound and how you can repair items and get items that might be damaged all of that type of bookkeeping which can be extremely involving and fun 
that's not offered here. That is, I think, a very big strength of D100 Dungeon. And Four Against Darkness, obviously, you're playing four characters, although there are rules now to play one or two or three characters, but I think the way the content of that game is written, it really does need and uh, is most robust with four characters. So for that alone, obviously, it is different than this. In terms of the rules, per se, or the mechanics, it is... I would say as light as this one. The the combat mechanic here is something that is interesting in terms of the die modification that I talked about earlier, but in the end I think that just became very mechanical in not a bad way, but it, it wasn't much. There's not, I don't think it's mechanics heavy and I don't think it's hard to understand, especially um, even with adding in the, the additional shift adjustment die after the third round of combat, it is um, it went pretty quickly, and it was mostly a matter of my remembering what pairings I was looking for with my rules and to uh, remember that by. But again, I think going back to what I said at the outset of the video, although I have warmed up a lot to the concept of my character and what he is carrying, the fact that, you know, I'm, I've got this heavy mace, that's what I'm going to be using the entire game. It doesn't really matter what I'm carrying. It just matters these combinations here. They're given names, but essentially um, I'll be getting some more maneuvers. I could switch out some maneuvers, but like in terms of narrative or theme, like this could be anything really. There's not anything in terms of uh, positioning or melee combat or uh, any type of, you know, hiding behind things or any of that type of modification. So there's, at least so far as I've seen now, I'll say, there, so in that sense, it is uh, really just about what you are coming upon in the extensive tables that you get. And the amount of content in here is just, it's ridiculous. It's so deep. I could go back and play level one again and have something completely different happening because each of these tables, many of them are have 36 entries in them in terms of what the rooms are. And then the extensive list I showed you earlier of like what can happen when you're in a room and then all the sub tables of what you can find and stuff like that. It's just awesome. And if you really, really wanted to ensure that nothing was the same, you could even put a little uh, mark in your book off of some value that you rolled so that if you rolled it again you would just go one higher or one lower and then really never encounter the same thing but even if you didn't do that just in terms of probability and um, the amount of content that's here for each level and there are 10 levels plus I got the layers expansion which are sort of a couple of one-off um, levels that don't count toward the uh, your legend status tracker. Oh, I get to mark off. I, I did finish level one, so I'm going to get to mark that off there. Um, these are just sort of outside of that. They have their own tables that are really extensive. So it's, if you're looking for kind of variability, replayability, and value for your money, um, I mean, obviously everybody calculates that differently, but I think this is extremely solid and it is in the three books, you don't need the cards because they're very nicely reproduced in the books themselves. And you don't just get the stats, but you get actually the reproduction of the card itself, which is awesome. I got the cards because I like having cards and I think I'm happy I did. But actually, I really think it would be fine to even play without the cards and because you would just be, you're using the book anyway. So you could just kind of mark that off and, and keep it open. You're not going to be looking at the tables and the enemy cards at the same time. So it wouldn't really matter if you were referring to the book itself as opposed to having just the card out on your character sheet. Well, not that card, but a card out on your character sheet as I had done. So that is a look inside 2D6 Dungeon. I can say that having finished level one, I am excited to immediately, well, not immediately, I'm excited to immediately figure out how I can spend my money. But after I spend my money and figure out what I'm going to get, excited to immediately start rolling up level two and continuing on. And that, I think, in the end is the mark of a good game. I'm sure I made some errors. I don't know whether I was like allowed to end up not exploring this whole area before moving on, because I could have kind of gone back and done that and 
you know, there's some space up here. This ended up being a, like a weird situation with this placement of this carter. But here, certainly, there's a little bit of space that I could have gone into. There's also an archway here I could have made a room. But this is how I chose to end things and take myself to level two. And I guess on some level, that is indicative of that's the risk I'm taking as an adventurer. I'm not going around and trying to um, get more stuff or, or amass more XP down here on the first or up here on the first floor. I'm going to go down to the second level and um, continue along with my exploration and 2d6 dungeon.